Well, first of all, I want to say that I'm voting for Mark Deacons as the next president in 2020. Wasn't he fired up today, huh? <laughs> it's good to see. I'm glad you bundled up and came out today, but I want to uh, just let you know we've had a snafu in our office, so the outline that's on your bulletin, the one on the screen will be right, but the outline in your bulletin is uh, from three weeks ago, so... Um, <laughs> So you, it's connecting. We've already talked about connecting. We're going to talk about responding to others. So disregard. And if you're going the same way for the contemporary service, I just wanted to uh, bring that to your attention. When I'm doing this, you're thinking, this doesn't match up, all right? I know I have issues, <laughs> but uh, today we, it's not going to match up. So three weeks ago, we introduced a word to you that defines how we are to go about loving our neighbor as ourselves. Do you remember that word? What was the word? Four-letter word. Care, thank you, all right, care, good job. We've been using this particular word as an acrostic to help us understand what loving my neighbor looks like. So let's do a little review. We discovered that the first letter, the letter C, stands for connect. And we talked about how we need to connect. If we're about going out and caring for people, then we're gonna connect with people. We're gonna uh, find ways to invest intentionally in their lives. The second letter is the letter A in the word care. And, and that letter, or that, that letter stands for what? Ask. Ask or pray. We, we talked about how that if we truly care for other people and we're going to love people as ourselves, we're going to pray a prayer for them. We're going to lift them up. Paul said, if you remember the passage in Colossians, Paul was talking about how that we're going to lift people up. He said, I continually lift you up. And our focus is not going to be on earthly minded prayers. You remember we talked about that. Most of our prayers are earthly minded. Paul prayed a kingdom minded prayer for those uh, that he was praying for, the Colossian Christians. And so for each other, I ask you, and I had one lady today say, you remember you told us to pray for somebody. Well, I'm praying for four people. And so I love that. So I hope you remember that that was the challenge that you will pray for somebody, that they, a kingdom focused prayer for that person. So today we come to the letter R. And the letter R stands for respond. It, 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 the third way that we show care for someone is by responding to them. And the word to respond simply means this, to act favorable, to have a favorable reaction to somebody or to act favorably to somebody. And certainly as Christ followers, we want to have a favorable reaction to those around us, to those who are in need of help. Whether they're inside these walls or they're outside these walls, our job is to respond. Uh, and this morning, I want to use a very familiar passage, the parable of the Good Samaritan. Now, even though we've heard this story many, many times, I, I wonder if at times in our lives that we forget its purpose. We forget the intent uh, of the story of the Good Samaritan. I, I know that's the way it works for me. For instance, ask yourselves this question. How many sermons have you heard on love in your lifetime? For those of you that have been here for, uh, on this earth a lot longer than I have, how many times do you think you've heard a sermon on love? And I would say that for most of you, the number would be into the low to mid 100s. You know, 52 weeks out of the year, how many times does, does a preacher preach on love? Uh, a lot. You, you take that by 30, 40, 50 years you've been in church, You've heard a lot about love, haven't you? So let me ask you this. Do you, do you have love down? Do you have it down? Do you never struggle with loving others? Do you always respond in the right way? You see, even though we've heard sermon after sermon, we've read book after book, we've, we've uh, had lesson after lesson in our Sunday school classes about love, we still fail at loving others, do we not? And I need to be reminded at times what love looks like because Craig Yates forgets. I know you don't, but I do. I need to get reminded of what caring for someone looks like because I tend to forget. Craig Yates tends to get too busy. I know that doesn't apply to you. Craig Yates tends to get too focused on himself. I know that doesn't apply to you. But do you hear me this morning? I need to be reminded that caring for others involves responding. Caring involves responding. You know, today is a day that's all about responding. Today is Veterans Day. It's a day that where we intentionally set out to remember those who responded to a world in need. To those who willingly and deliberately took action when they saw people in need. This day is a day that we celebrate those who showed up. 
to those who literally left the safety of their own lives to help others who were in need. Now, can you imagine what our world would look like had not our men and women in the service not showed up over the years in the many different wars and just policing the world in general? Could you imagine what our world would look like? Our world is a better place because these brave men and women showed up. They responded. And in the same light, the parable of the Good Samaritan, it's a story that's all about responding it's a story about responding to those in need. It's a story about people showing up when they see a need, when someone needs help. It's a story about being there when a need arises. Out of all of Jesus' parables, probably the Good Samaritan is one that most people are familiar with. We have on the Good Morning American Today show, they honor people and they call people Good Samaritans. Uh, headlines in the newspapers or magazines will, will have that title, Good Samaritan. So people are familiar with this. And, and the phrase Good Samaritan, all it means is this. It's, descri- it's a word to use to describe any person who goes out of their way to help someone else. Any person who goes out of their way to help someone else. The story of the Good Samaritan ultimately is a story that reflects our heart. It's a story that reflects our heart. Am I just going through the motions when I talk about responding to those in need? When I talk about loving others? When I talk about caring for others? Do I just go through the motions? Do I just sound good in front of my Sunday school class, in front of my church people, in front of my family? Or do I truly respond with all my heart? That's that's what I see with the response and our response, what it should be. It comes from the heart, and that's why Jesus told this story. Is my heart connected to what I see? Is my heart connected to what I see? And a lot of times, mine's not. And I think that's the point of the story. So let's look at the story. Let's read here. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. He said, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, Jesus replied. How do you read it? And he answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? We see from our text today that there was an expert in the law who came to Jesus and asked the question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, when the text says it describes this man as an expert in the law, he is basically referring to a man who is skilled in interpreting the Jewish law, the first five books of the Old Testament. This guy knows he is a scholar on the first five books of the Old Testament. And Luke shows us that this expert has an underlying motive as to why he asked the question. It says in the text that he wanted to test Jesus. Have you ever had anybody that wanted to test you? You took their question to you as a test. And so basically this guy wanted to kind of try. We would say try Jesus. We would say that he wanted to tempt Jesus with a question. And in Luke's account of this exchange, it's a different question, but the same purpose as we looked at back in Matthew 22 at the beginning of our series. But in each case, it comes down to this. Which commandment is the greatest? In each case, it's all about this. What's at the heart of the law? The questions that the expert in the laws would ask is what's at the heart of the law? And so as we've studied these exchanges between the expert in the law and Jesus for the past several weeks, one thing is clear. We've been able to see the real motive behind the question was not one of sincerity. Whether this expert in the law was trying to trip up Jesus into saying something that he would regret later on, or or some scholars think that this lawyer maybe was just wanted to see how much Jesus really knew, how much this upstart guy from Galilee really knew about the law. It really doesn't matter because in the end, his question was just a test. Now, More than likely, this guy, this expert in law, he probably could have cared less about loving his neighbor as himself, as we'll see a little bit later. I'll explain who, who a Jewish person thought was their neighbor. He could, he could have probably cared less about responding to those in need. He had his status. He had his position. His only goal was to make Jesus look bad. He was pretending to be sincere. He was pretending to be honest. He was pretending to be earnest. He was pretending to care. And here's the big question, church. When it comes to truly loving others, when it comes to truly caring about people enough to respond to their needs, am I a pretender 
or am I a contender? Don't, don't you hate people that are fake? I, I hate the word that say hate. Don't you not like somebody that really when they're fake to you? I don't want to say again, hate. Hey, sorry, take the, I can't take that off. Uh, but, but I don't like it. I don't want to be fake. I don't want to be fake. When I care and when I respond to somebody, I want, to be, I want it to come from my heart. I want my motives to be pure. You see, the good Samaritan, he was a contender. He was not a pretender. And how he responded to the man lying on the road, he, he was a contender. There was no pretending on his terms. And so what I want to do today is give you three ways that we can look from this story and see how we can go about responding to others in our world and truly care for others in our world. So number one is this. Responding to others involves seeing. Before we can respond to others, we've got to see others. You look what Jesus said. It says, in reply, Jesus said, go back for me. Go back one. In reply, Jesus said a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. Do you see well? Do you see well? I've talked to you, to you about my struggles with seeing the older I get. We've talked about that. Sometimes we don't see as well as we, uh, uh, as we need to as we get older. That's why we have glasses. Um, I went to lunch with uh, Mark Deacons and Doug this past, maybe Monday, I guess. Uh, we went to uh, Pi Five. It was Pizza Week. Did anybody celebrate Pizza Week this week throughout Lexington? Uh, you know I know about these issues or these weeks. So uh, we went there, and of course, one of the rules of Pizza Week is no substitutions. You, you got to have the pizza. They have these pizzas already made up, and you got to have it exactly that. So I didn't want something on this pizza, and there was a sign there that I did not see in line. And so I asked the waitress, I said, can I not get that? And she says, no, I'm sorry. You, you got you to take it. And so Doug elbows me, my friend Doug, and says, Craig. There's a sign right there. And I said, I know, all right, I know. No substitutions, no substitutions. But I didn't see the sign. Isn't it amazing what we don't see? Center Point Project. Uh, it was probably two months ago. I came down here, I come downtown every day because I work downtown. I went by there. I don't go, always go by the Center Point Project, but it was like, man, it's almost a complete building. I know it's far from complete, but to me, it was like almost a complete building. Where have I been? How have I not noticed that? So you go through your neighborhood. You say, oh man, they painted that house. Well, your wife tells you, well, they painted that house like two months ago. Where were you? <laughs> it's amazing what we don't see, but here's an even scarier thought, church. Isn't it amazing what I see but choose to ignore? Do you hear me? Isn't it amazing what I see but choose to ignore? You know what I'm talking about. Things that make us uncomfortable, so we just turn the other way. Like when we pull up to a stop sign, there's a homeless person there with a sign. How many of us turn away? I, I've done that. I've done that. I don't want to look them in the eye. Now, there's other times where I tell them, hey, come down here to the Bread of Life on Wednesdays and Fridays. Uh, I, I never really give them money. I always tell them about some place they can get food. But I look the other way. I see, but I ignore. Uh, I saw it yesterday, unfortunately, in our Iron Man. Uh, we had a guy sitting at a table. He came a week before and he came this week. No one went around to him and said, Come sit at my table. And he left. Church, people saw that man sitting there and did nothing to invite that man to their table. It breaks my heart, and I'm guilty too. In our story, Jesus gives us similar examples of people who saw, but for whatever reason, chose to ignore what they saw. They chose not to engage or not to reach out. And in the story, we see that there was a priest and a Levite. It says a priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. You see, the priest was a member of what today we would call the clergy. He was like Craig Yates, Doug Pyatt, Mark Deacons. He was God's representative. And the Levite that was there was the priest assistant. Now think about what both of them had just been doing in Jerusalem. What do you think they both had been doing? 
They both have been probably preaching. They both have been teaching. They probably have been loving the community. But here they go on their way down to Jericho. And maybe they're, maybe they're going for some R&R. Man, don't you love to have some R&R when, you've, when you put in a good week? When you put in a hard week? Uh, maybe a little time with the family. So no complaints on that. But even though they just come from serving, doesn't it surprise you that even though they just come from serving God, from teaching about God, don't you find the end or in, very interesting that the disconnect between their eyes and their heart. They were not connected. There was a disconnect somewhere. somewhere. And, and it leaves me scratching my head and I'm thinking, what's up? What's up with this? But I do the same thing. Before we throw the priest and, and the, under the bus and the Levite under the bus, because that's what we like to do. We like to say, look at them, but we don't look inward. Be sure and ask yourself this question. Am I guilty of doing the same? Am I guilty of doing the same thing. What happens after you hear a sermon on Sunday mornings about loving others? When you leave this building, you go typically, we most of us go to a restaurant, we go eat. Do you always remember to love while you're driving to the restaurant? We all have issues with, our, with driving, especially when people get in front of us. How about remembering to love when, the, when they told you at the restaurant it would only be a 15-minute wait? It's only going to be 15 minutes. We'll have you a table in no time, and it's 30 minutes. My test came this week on Friday night. We went out to eat with Rob and Debbie and, and Kathy. We went to, uh, I'm not going to name the place. I thought about just throwing it in there. I'm not going to name the place. But I had a wonderful meal. Again, pizza week. Uh, I went to the bathroom, came back. And the waitress is cleaning up pizza sauce on, the, uh, on, the, on the, uh, the bench and got some on my wife's coat. And so what bugged me about this was there was no, hey, well, give us the dry cleaning bill. Here's a dry cleaner to take it to. We've talked about this restaurant thing before, haven't we? And I don't understand why that it used to be, hey, we'll take care of this for you. Here's a free meal. Not that I'm looking for a free meal, all right? Not that I'm looking for a free meal, but it just bugged me. And even though we had eaten, it stayed on my mind. And I'm thinking, why do they not do this? But again, I go back to the Good Samaritan. That was my test this week. I wanted to say something to her in love, but I, then I didn't want to be picky. So, I, now you're laughing. I wanted to say something to her in love, all right? You see, it's easy to throw stones at the priest and Levi, but have we looked in the mirror lately? More than likely, you probably haven't passed by someone lying on the side of the road, bloody and beaten, but who have you passed by lately? Someone in need of a kind word, someone in need of encouragement, someone in need of direction, someone in need of a friend. Seeing others, not ignoring them is the first step in responding to others. Second thing, responding to others involves taking action. Responding to others involves taking action. Look with me what the text says. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. See, once we see, we have to take action. And that's what the Samaritan did. The priest and the Levite did not take action. Look at the action steps this Samaritan took when he saw this beaten up man. He went to, put in, he went to him, putting himself in danger. How many times would we, we see somebody like that and we'd say, well, what if there's somebody out there ready to jump me? We would have all these fearful thoughts about not doing it. He didn't have this. He bandaged his wounds using his own supplies. He poured oil and wine and putting his own health at risk. He put the man on his donkey, meaning that he walked the rest of the way into the town. He brought him to an inn. He took care of him. He gave his own money to the innkeeper to look after him. And he said, I will reimburse you for anything that you spend when I come back. Do you see the action steps that this man took? Do you see how the Samaritan's heart was connected to what he saw? His heart caused him to take action. Years ago, a contemporary Christian group called DC Talk, they had a song that was love is a verb. And it's so true. Love is not something that we keep inside of us. Love is something that is an action word. We go out of ourselves and we act and we respond. 
And Jesus was the master at this. Jesus was the master at taking action. Think of how his heart was always connected to what he saw. Look with me at one, uh, what one passage describes him. It says, Jesus went through all the towns and the villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. And when he saw the crowds, he didn't go the other way. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. Because they were harassed and helpless. And the passage says like sheep without a shepherd. Another passage right before Jesus would uh, feed the 5,000. It says when Jesus landed. He, remember he was trying to get away from the crowds. He was trying to get away and he landed and there's this crowd. Jesus landed and saw a large crowd and he had compassion on them. And he healed their sick. Wasn't taking action Jesus' whole point in, in this in the sheep and the goats. It's always about taking action. It's responding to what you see. Look what it says here. Then the king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance. The kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you what? You gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you what? You gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you what? You invited me in. I needed clothes and what? You clothed me. I was what? I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Those are the ones on the right. And then remember what he said to the ones on his left. The sheep and then the goats. And goats does not stand for greatest of all time, as the sports world says. You don't want to be a goat. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who were cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me just a little sliver, a little something. You gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison. You did not look after me. And he will reply. I'm sorry. Then they said, Lord, when do we see you hungry? When do we see you thirsty? When do we see you a stranger and eating clothes or sick and in prison? Lord, when do we see you? And Jesus said what? He said, I, will re I reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do to me. Churches, we talk about loving God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. What loving my neighbor as myself truly looks like, it comes down to seeing and responding. Knopfel Staten says this. He says, our love to God always has love to others as its expressional goal. We talked before about when we get the inside right, when we love God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength, then we can love our neighbor as ourself. Only when we get the inside right can we do the outside right. And this is the whole point of Jesus' story. He says this, which of the three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law, the guy knew, the expert in the law knew, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go, go and do likewise. Responding to others involves taking action. Third way, final way, responding to others involves no restrictions. Responding to others involves no restrictions. This is an important one for us to remember, and let me give you three quick ways to remember about this point. Don't restrict responding to others to those we know. Don't restrict responding to others to those who are like us. Don't restrict responding to others to those who can return the favor. You see, the Jews typically interpreted the term neighbor to mean one who is near, meaning one who is like me. So this expert, his neighbor, to him a neighbor meant a person who was Jewish, a person like him. A neighbor to him was one who believed the same way that he believed. The term neighbor to this expert meant one of his own race and one of his own community. Are we guilty of doing the same sometimes? Restricting our neighbor to those who are just like us. Maybe the way we were raised, where we live, the songs we sing, the way we dress. Church, there's a gap between our generations today. Not just out there, but inside here. We see it in the world. We see it in the church. We see it in Broadway, unfortunately. That's what I loved about last week with our homecoming service if you were here, wasn't it great? Wasn't it fabulous? Didn't God deliver his spirit in a mighty way last week? And so thank you for praying. It was great to have us all come together, young and old, black and white, rich and poor, seniors and millennials, 
together. And just let me say something here too. I'm 55 years old. Some of you are older uh, than I am. Some of you are my age in here. Some of you are maybe younger. But uh, we have two services here. We have two services for a reason. But when we come together, as Mark talked about in his communion devotion, we want to come together as a family. We, we want everybody here. You remember the family reunions when somebody wouldn't show up? You, where, where's, where's Uncle Bob? Where's Uncle Mark? How come they aren't here? You want everybody here? And I just want to plead to you, church, try to understand that there's a difference in, in a millennial, which is a 22 to 36-year-old, and how they look at worship and what worship is to them, and, and for you as a 70-year-old or an 80-year-old or a 60-year-old or a 55-year-old, we're different. You know, Mark told me about a shirt. Mark, uh, Don told me about a shirt of a millennials will wear. It's like this. I don't want to talk to you, but I want you to like me. <laughs> uh, I mean, that's, that's, that's their world. I don't understand that world. Mark and I are 12 days apart. He's 12 days older than me, but he's 15 years younger than me than in thought. He gets it. I don't get it. That's why I'm in here. But here's the, here's the deal, church. The gap is widening. The gap is widening in our culture, and it's our call or our responsibility to change it, embrace it. Their feet, just like you're a hand, right? They're an eye, just like you're an ear. Right? We're all one family, and please, please celebrate the times we come together. You see, in the story of the Good Samaritan, Jesus ups the ante with how we are supposed to show our love to others, to those who are different from us. He reiterated this point in another sermon. He said this, if you love only those who love you, why should you get credit for that? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to only those to, who do good to you, why should you get credit? Even sinners do that much. And if you lend money only to those who can repay, why should you get credit? Even sinners will lend to other sinners for a full return. And James brings it, I think, to our attention again when he said the same thought. He says, if anyone, if anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. No restrictions in how we respond to each other. As we close today, I want to give you four words to remember as you set out to respond to care for those in need. Number one is see. Number two is sympathize. Number three is seize. And number four is spend. See, sympathize, seize, and spend. Our world, church, needs us to respond. There's a suicide stat. I couldn't believe this. 22 people a day commit suicide. One every 65 minutes in our world commits suicide. Our world is hurting. Our world is hurting. In a world in which we have all these different ways to connect with people, people are lonely. People are searching for a friend. And will you be that friend? Will you respond to them? So I wanna lay down a challenge to you today. Mark's gonna do it in the second service. We talked this week. And so we came up with this. How can we live out to respond to those in our, in our city? Let's look at this. How many of you have Facebook? Would you raise your hand? Oh, great, great. If you have Facebook, if you have a Twitter page, if you have Instagram, we want to do this. And, and please hear me. It's not, not about promoting you and not about promoting the church. It's really not. It's just a challenge I want to lay down to you for us as a family of Broadway Christian Church. And I know you may think this is promoting myself, but just hear me out, please. All right, hear me out. We live in a world that is about capturing the moments. We, we, we live for that, right? Facebook, Twitter. I mean, just look at Facebook. People are always posting updates of where they ate dinner, what movie they saw, what concert they went to, pictures of the kids on trick or treat or at their ball games. We live in that world, do we not? All right, so let's take this to our advantage. Let's work this to our advantage. So over the next month, over the next month, I want to challenge you. We want to challenge you to see and take actions with no restrictions. So when you see somebody in need of help, I'm going to challenge you to do something about it. And, I, and if possible, I would love for you to take the picture of, of a person that you're helping. Not to promote you, it's to promote God. But we want to see how many of these stories we can get, how many of these posts we can get as a family at Broadway to see that we are getting, that we are going to live this out. So, for instance, when you see a person, uh, maybe before you go to work, you just pack up three 
or four Kroger bags of just maybe a gift card, a $5 gift card, maybe just a bag of chips, maybe a thing of water. And as you pull up to that red light or that stop sign and there's that homeless person there, just roll down your window and say, sir, I don't have any money for you or ma'am, I don't have any money for you, but here, I've got this. As you're walking down the street and you see somebody, maybe just have some extra cards, uh, little gift cards, and you see somebody in need, go. Now, I'm talking about people that are homeless. I'm talking about people that are in need of something physical, but maybe it's somebody you work with. Just give them the time. Say, hey, can we grab lunch? Can we grab coffee? Respond to people and, and, and post that on your Facebook. Say, here's the, here's, the, here's the hashtag we want you to use. Hashtag BCC respond. So would you do that? We're asking you to do that. All, all throughout this series, we've been reminded that Jesus said that basically there are two things. There are two priorities for us as his followers. Number one is to love God. Number two is to love people. Everything is summed up in those two words. And here's the truth. You can't know one without doing the other. You can't know one without doing the other. Would you pray with me? Father, I just thank you so much for our time together today. God, I thank you and praise you that, uh, that you saw us and you responded to us by sending your son, Jesus Christ, into this world to give us life. And so I pray that as we looked at this Good Samaritan story today, the purpose of the story that Jesus told us, help our hearts to be connected to what we see. God, just help us not to turn the other way, not to turn our eyes away from the hurt because we're uncomfortable with it. Help us, God, move us by your spirit, not because of our power, but because of your power that we can do this. And so, Father, help us as we go out this next month specifically looking of how we can respond to others. Work through us. Just anoint the conversations ahead of time, uh, the, the happenstances ahead of time, God, that where we would meet somebody, that where we could just do this. Put this upon our heart. Put this upon our mind. Help us to live this next 30 days with conviction to respond to others. We thank you for hearing us. We thank you for working through us and empowering us to equipping us to do what you call us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to ask you to stand. If you have a need today, need of prayer, we ask you to come. We'll, we'll pray with you. If you're searching for something in your life, let me tell you, Jesus is here for you today. and You can have him today. If you're looking for a church family to be a part of, we would love to have you a part of Broadway Christian Church. Would you come if you have a decision today?